with my PhD advisor, Chavo Chucky, and a student, Andrew Gomez. We looked at anomalies in the EFT, the onshore wave. So just to recap, uh, what's an anomaly? Um, an anomaly is a classical symmetry that's violated the quantum level, which uh, corresponds to non-invariance of the measure of the path integral. Uh, just a, a quick recap. Um, the uh, most famous kind of anomaly is uh, for the axial rotation of quarks. Uh, so for example, see this Lagrangian, it's just the gauge field coupled to, uh, coupled to uh, fermions. If we do an axial rotation on the fermions, this is uh, the matrix for chiral rotation, we see that we have a classically conserved current Okay, which corresponds uh, from North Earth's theorem to a symmetry under a chiral rotation. The question is what happens quantum mechanically? And to do that, you need to look at the path of the board. So like I said, uh, under an axial rotation, uh, the path integral measure is non-invariant, and this can be seen using the famous Fujikawa method. So we get this extra load factor, which is uh, the anomaly. It goes like FF dual for the gauge field. Uh, we can do uh, um, a little uh, calculation of the path integral. We can uh, write the path integral when integrating over the fermions and not the gauge field. And just by doing a simple transformation, we can present it in this way, where here is the divergence of the current, which would be classically conserved. We have the extra contribution from the anomaly at the cone level. So that says that. Um, the expectation value of the current, uh, um, its divergence is not zero, but it's actually equal, equals to the anomaly, and that means that there's a violation of the classical symmetry at the quantum level. So that's so why the, why the kill cubic? I thought it kills square, right? No, it, it's actually goes like Q. Q, 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 Q is a charge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. You, you can check this. Actually, it was weird for me as well. I looked at uh, passing notes for anomalies. And Good. So usually when we talk about uh, anomalies, we always think about triangle diagrams. So uh, let's connect the anomaly that we saw from the Fujikawa method to a triangle diagram. Well, if we uh, take the derivative, derivatives with respect to the gauge fields, we can actually link this to a vertex that uh, uh, is actually the triangle diagram when presented in momentum space. So this is the famous triangle diagram with one insertion of the actual current. And here, couple of the two vector currents. Um, now, this loop has a regularization ambiguity. So, when you have a mixed anomaly, in this case, it's between the vector current and the axial current. I can choose how to regulate it, and I can choose to regulate it such that it conserves the vector, or it conserves the axial. But I cannot regulate it uh, such that it conserves both. That's the meaning of having a mixed anomaly. Okay, so. In particular, I can choose the regulator to preserve my vector symmetry, and that means that my anomaly uh, lives in the axial current, and that's what I get from just uh, calculating and regulating the loop appropriately. And this corresponds exactly to what we found from uh, Fujikawa. Any questions about this? So this is textbook stuff. Gauge anomaly is the big no no. So, uh, at least when I uh, took QFT1 uh, or 2, I think, uh, people told me you always have to check if you have any kind of model, you have to check that you have gauge anomaly cancellation. Because if you have a gauge anomaly in the theory, it uh, signals the breakdown of the theory. You can't quantize it correctly. Okay? So, how do you couple, uh, how do you gauge a symmetry? You uh, couple the current to the gauge field. Now, if the current is not conserved, gauge invariance is broken, and the uh, seeming uh, catastrophe is because we can't establish the equivalence of the Lorentz and unitary gauge. Okay? So we can't quantize in a Lorentz invariant way. Basically, we're saying that the theory sucks. So the solution in the standard model is to have anomaly cancellation. So to check that, the charges of all the fermions conspire to cancel all triangle diagrams. So you have no gauge anomalies in the standard model, and the theory is not safe. 
here's a toy example of how anomaly cancellation works. And this is a toy example that I took from a well-known paper from the 80s by Joker and Hardy, which uh, a lot of the material here will come from that paper. So we introduce SC2 cross C1 case theory with fermions in uh, two n, two small n generations. So you have left-handed in the doublet of SC2L with a hypercharge YI. And you have these singlet right hand fields that we just gather together in a doublet, but it's not really a doublet, it's just for a notation. And these are their hypercharges, and you'll soon see why we have this uh, kind of uh, creative charge assignment. The Lagrangian is just the field trans squared for uh, uh, 2 and u1, and the usual minimal coupling to the gauge fields. And you can see that. Uh, here there's a coupling to SC2 acting on the left because it's a doublet, but here there's no uh, A for the SC2 because these are singlets of uh, SC2. The fermions couple chirally, so potentially you have uh, U1 uh, cubed and an SC2 squared cross U1 mixed anomaly. And to do, uh, to, we can simply calculate the anomalies using a Kujikao method or triangle diagrams, uh, you name it. And we see that these are uh, the expressions for the non-conservation of the currents. And note that we want this to be zero because we said that if it couples to a gauge boson, the uh, divergence of the current better be zero. So note here that we have a contribution from all the generations of the fermions. Here also a contribution from all the Variations of the fermions. Specifically, you can check that all the anomalies cancel if the sum of all the charges is zero. If we impose this constraint, this theory is anomaly free, and it's not sick. Now here's the question. What happens if we hix the theory and we actually integrate out one heavy generation of fermions? The EFT, the low energy EFT, would look inconsistent because now it lacks one generation of fermion that was needed in order to cancel the anomalies. We hix the theory by introducing this hix, which breaks SE2 plus C1 to E1. And we arrange for the hix potential to be such that the hix is extremely heavy, the Yukawa coupling with one of the generations to be large, so we can integrate it out. And the other lighter generations and the massive gauge bosons are lighter, so uh, they remain in our theory. We integrate out the nth generation of fermions, so we're left with a massive theory, but this time we don't have that the sum of charges are zero, so we are wondering if this theory, if T is consistent, and can it be quantized in a Lorentz invariant way. The solution that Torque and Farhi told us is that by integrating out uh, the nth generation of fermions were actually creating an effective Wesselmino Witten term, actually a gauge one. And the variation of this term actually cancels the contribution to the anomaly from the n minus 1 light fermions. So the EFT is actually anomaly canceled, and we'll see this explicitly soon. So we have an EFT, right? An EFT below the mass of the physical Higgs and below the mass of the heavy generation of fermions. What's this EFT going to look like? So one thing is clear. We have a, we have a Higgs that breaks SC2 cross U1 to U1. So we can write simply a nonlinear sigma model, which involves uh, the, um, the uh, pions of the breaking, the pion matrix of the breaking, the nonlinear the transforming uh, field under SC2 cross U1, the actual gauge fields that remain in our theory, even though they're massive now, and the light fermions. But there's also a contribution which reproduces, uh, which actually is crucial for anomaly cancellation, which comes from the Western Mean term and from this boson Wolchuk term. Now, you can understand these contributions as one, they're just needed in order to cancel the anomaly, but I didn't just add them by hand. I literally can compute them by integrating out the uh, nth heavy fermion and having these, and seeing these effective terms. And that's what Dorker and Farr can do. The first term, the Wesson Mino Witten term, uh, that uh, actually is uh, crucial for the cancellation of the non-perturbative SU2 anomaly. 
So we started with two n fermions, so that did not have a non perturbative SU2 anomaly, but we uh, integrated out one generation. So now we have an odd number of fermions, so potentially they would have a non perturbative SU2 anomaly. This term actually serves to cancel that anomaly, it has an equal and opposite contribution to the non perturbative anomaly. But I'm not going to uh, dwell on it too much because it's not crucial for our story. The other term uh, is uh, what I call the improved Wollstone Wilkshire term. So that's a term that you can literally find out by integrating out the fermions. It's a little complicated, so I, uh, I'm breaking it down for you. It has two kinds of terms. These kind of terms are actually responsible for canceling the anomalies, canceling the U and Q and canceling the mixed anomaly. So why do we need this extra term? Remember that I told you in the beginning that when we have a triangle diagram, we have the freedom to regulate this tri triangle diagram to uh, conserve the vector and violate the axial, or conserve the axial and, um, and violate the vector. So this is a local counter term that I can add to this Lagrangian that corresponds to this uh, regulator ambiguity uh, from the fermion loop. And here I'm simply adding this counter term to put the weight of the mixed anomaly between the U1 and the SC2 squared only on the U1. So, so this will make the SC2 current preserved, but it will violate the U1. And now I have, uh, and now we'll have this term here that will serve to cancel the uh, violation of the U1 current from the SC2 resistance. So one of them shifts the violation to the U1, and these are the ones that actually cancel the U1 cube that we mixed them up. Can I, can I ask a question? So, uh, so I mean, if I had a <coughs> specific microscopic theory, that microscopic theory, uh, you know, pigses the, the, the full gauge symmetry in some way, doesn't that symmetry then uniquely determine this term? Yeah. If I, if I have such a thing. So, for example, if I if I break it down to some diagonal U1, then that thing has to be such that that diagonal U1 is the symmetry that can be gauged, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure I'm following. Yeah. So you you can think about it. you decided in the UV when you had the fermions right. uh, what is violated and what is right, not, right, right. and then that determines whether or not you have a local counter term in the UFT. There's a matching yeah. between you. Good. So let's actually check that the anomalies in the EFT are uh, canceled. So this is uh, this is the contribution of the light fermions. You see that there's a sum to n minus one. By the way, this form is fixed by what's called uh, Western Union consistency conditions, um, and that contribution is exactly canceled by the local counter term that we that we uh, saw here. Now, about the violation of the U1 current, both from the cubed anomaly and from the mixed anomaly, this is canceled by the two other parts uh, that are responsible for anomaly cancellation. So great. So the uh, EFT is also anomaly canceled. It had to be so because it's just an EFT of a consistent theory, so it better be consistent. Quick summary. Gauge anomalies are bad, or at least in the age they're bad. We'll talk about that. Uh, and gauge anomalies in the EFT, you start in the UV with an anomaly free theory. You <coughs> mix the theory, integrate out the heavy fermion. The EFT is also anomaly free because there's non trivial anomaly cancellation between the gauge West and term and the contribution of the uh, light fermions. It's a very nice story that I just told you, but there's a big question here. Is this description really gauge invariant. And this is something we're going to study. And here's a Skype call from John. He's <laughs> <laughs> uh, there in the spirit. He's here in the spirit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's have another another look at, at this like Wilson Wolchek current that was responsible for an omni cancellation. We have the local canister. term. And we had these terms which were actually important to cancel the anomalies. Um, <clears throat> but if we go to unitary gauge, everything that has U is eaten, right? 
So exactly the terms that I said were crucial and important to canceling the anomaly are not there anymore in the interviews. They go away. And we're only left with the local account term whose job is to move the anomaly from one place to another, but not cancel the anomaly altogether. So what happened here is anomaly canceled theory equivalent to a non-anomaly canceled theory. So that's the, that's the question. And the answer has been known since 91. There's a seminal paper by John Presto uh, called Gage Anomalies and Effective Field Theory. And the main point of this paper is that there's actually no problem in quantizing a gauge theory which is anomalous when it's in the, in the Higgs phase and it's an EFT. Um, moreover, this thing that we saw that there were effective gauge Wesleyan written terms that canceled the anomaly. That's just a gauge artifact. That's just seen in one gauge. If you go to unitary gauge, it goes in it. So what's the gauge invariant statement? The gauge invariant statement is we don't need the theory to be anomaly canceled. As long as it's Higgs, it's completely fine to couple to an anomalous matter content. And if we're still uneasy, we can always uh, go to a gauge where it looks like there's an anomaly cancellation with effective So uh, I must say on a personal note that uh, my path throughout this project was uh, the historical path that uh, the field went through. So I read the Doku of Farky paper, I thought I'd figure it all out, uh, there was an anomaly cancellation, and then I read the Presto paper and my mind was blown because wait, what I thought wasn't, wasn't right. Okay, so what's Presto's argument? Uh, we start with a massive gauge theory, and it's an anomalous because it couples to a single while for me. Should be a problem, right? Uh, should be a problem because when we do a gauge transformation, the theory has an anomaly, which goes like the FF dual term. But now, we want to be a little clever, and we introduce a gauge artifact field B. So this field is not real, because we, all, we can always find a gauge that this field is zero. And we, now we put up a gauge invariant description of the theory because we can postulate that the field shifts like this under a gauge transformation in a way which exactly cancels uh, the anomaly. So now, this theory looks anomaly free, while this theory looked anomalous to us, but both theories are just a gauge transformation away from each other. But it's a gauge artifact. I can always gauge it to... No, but you're out of the degree of freedom because you now you would have to use your gauge freedom to eliminate that field, whereas before you could have used it to eliminate components of your A. The degree of freedom was already there. It was like a two-dimensional component of the Oh, I'm sorry. You're just talking about a massive field. Yeah. yeah. This is your stupid field. Yeah. 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 OK. So the, the theory of the B and the theory with that to be are completely gauge equivalent. One looks anomaly. Uh, anomalous and the other looks anomaly free. So the conclusion that we draw is that there's no physical difference between an anomaly canceled theory and a uh, non-anomaly canceled theory as long as your theory is massive and there's no such thing to be Moreover, Prescott gives us, specifically in the Abelian case, a prescription for where the cutoff of my EFT is, where I should start seeing the Higgs and heavy fermion. Uh, and this cutoff uh, Contrary to uh, uh, what we might think, it comes from calculability of the theory. Just because uh, if we uh, add the B interactions to the theory, we can get uh, these effective operators, and the theory is no longer calculable uh, if lambda is larger than 4 pi V, where V is this quantity. I can think about it as like, literally the V, the expectation value of this. Higgs, but because I'm working in uh, I'm working in EFT below the physical Higgs. So in an abelian theory, there's an upper limit of what my cutoff might be, and this is where the Higgs should come, and this is actually where the heavy fermion should come and resolve uh, uh, our anomaly, anomaly cancellation. Okay. So. Uh, so now we're back to the question, didn't we say that anomalous gauge theories cannot be quantized? Apparently massive anomalous gauge theories can be quantized. But we showed that in a, in a gauge-dependent way. 
Okay? And now our research question is, if there's a fundamental difference that can be formulated in the gauge invariant way between a massive theory, a massless theory and a massive theory, which allows us to quantize the massive theory but not the masses. So it's not like we're not happy with uh, Prescott's argument, but Prescott's argument is an inherently gauge dependent statement, and we want a gauge invariant answer. So to understand the consistency of uh, the massive theory, we first focus on the massless theory and show why it's inconsistent, and we want to show it in a uh, gauge invariant way. Luckily, there's a, a very interesting paper from 2014 by Yu Ten Wang, uh, Chen, and McGinley, which talk about, uh, talks about the uh, gauge anomalies in an onshell formalism. So without ever introducing an action, without ever saying the word gauge field, they're showing why a theory that involves massless vectors coupled to anomalous and anomalous matter content, that theory is inherently inconsistent. And it's not inconsistent because it breaks gauge, because it never set gauge. It's inconsistent because there's tension between the unitarity of the theory and the locality of the theory. And this is what we're going to show you. So to start, uh, we'll, we'll uh, recap a little on the onshore formalism. So in the onshore formalism, we don't, we never introduce an action. So the way we do it is we introduce basic uh, Lego blocks, which are three-point amplitudes, and then we can assemble them together in sort of a recursive way to find all uh, higher point tree-level amplitudes. And then we can further assemble them together using unitarity in order to have one loop and higher loop amplitudes. Now the three-point amplitudes and higher amplitudes are largely fixed by uh, what's called little group uh, transformation. Just from the fact that I said that I had a massless vector with a certain velocity, and a massless fermion with some velocity, and another massless fermion with some velocity, it uh, nails down a lot of the amplitude. For example, uh, these are spinner velocity variables. Each uh, one uh, has a minus half velocity associated with it. Now, we want to could assemble these uh, Lego blocks together to saturate the transformation property that is derived from the fact that this is a minus one velocity, this is a minus half, and this is a plus half velocity uh, part. So let's see about the three. We want uh, minus one, so we've got to have this angle three here twice. Minus half, again minus half, so that saturates with minus one property <coughs> of the three. For the two, we want uh, minus half. So we have minus half, again minus half, but we're dividing by a minus half, so we're left with a minus half. So this saturates the little group transformation for this one. For the one, we need a plus, so it's one over uh, a velocity minus half, so it's a velocity plus half. And these are the explicit definitions of uh, spinner velocity variable and you can put variables and you can see that they just depend on the angles phi and theta and the energies of uh, the moment the form momentum of the particles. They can decompose the momentum in this way into spinning velocity variables. And one important thing that I need to say is that this is true for the masses uh, for massless particles and we'll go to massive particles later. Okay, so for example, I can lay out my basic building blocks. Uh, a minus one vector going to a plus minus fermions, and a plus one vector going to uh, plus minus fermions. This is set to this, and this has the exact opposite uh, helicity, so the angle spinners become uh, bracket spinners. Now, how do I know that I don't have any low group invariant factor in front of these things? Okay? Uh, the reason is locality, because if that low group factor has a pole, it goes like 1 over s minus n or something. That pole, according to locality, uh, should correspond to some particle going on shell. But we know that in the three-point amplitude, you can't have a particle 
one shell, and this means, together with dimensional analysis, means that there can only be a numerical coefficient. So there's no random function of many standards. This is how you fix three point functions in the onshore formalism. A similar thing that you can do is you can uh, look for what your four point function for plus one, minus one uh, uh, vectors and a plus half, minus half <coughs> fermions. Little group dictates this factor, and from dimensional analysis uh, and, uh, and cyclicity, uh, cyclical dependence on the outgoing moment, I know that I have some generic factors here. This is the little group invariant factor. And now I want to fix it. How do I fix it? I told you that in a local theory, when I go to a pole, it needs to factorize into uh, lower point amplitudes. This is a manifestation of locality. You can think about it as something happens here, a particle goes on shell, and then decays over there. Good. So if I go to the um, uh, <coughs> S-channel residue, the amplitude should factorize, there should be some exchange of the onshell particle, and here I write the lower point amplitude. Uh, well, here, L is, uh, represents the momentum of the intermediate particle, which is massless. When I calculate this, I see that it fixes uniquely uh, CS is 2S and CT is 2T. And so, actually, by little group alone, we can nail down uh, this amplitude as well. In this way, we can evaluate all our uh, tree-level diagrams level amplitudes, uh, and we use little group, dimensional analysis, and locality. To go to one loop, uh, we will need unitarity as well. So why are we going to one loop? Well, because we know that a triangle diagram is one loop, and we're hunting for anomalies, so the anomaly will probably rear its ugly head at one loop. Okay. So at one loop, we have a little group uh, invariant factor, which, uh, okay, let me recap. We're looking for the anomaly in the one loop amplitude of uh, four massless vectors. With, we imagine there's a loop of chiral fermions in, in the middle. From the field theory perspective, maybe you'd expect a triangle diagram. But in a triangle diagram, when you set the outgoing legs on the shell, it'll actually be zero. So we're not going to see it in an onshell formula. So we go, we go for the next best thing. We, we look for four uh, outgoing vectors, massless vectors, with a fermion box loop in the middle. And now we're trying to fix what this amplitude is by all the onshell tools that we have. Little group, uh, dimensional uh, analysis, locality, and also unitary. So now we want to use unitary to fix this little bit of the So your vector is U1, right? There's no non abelian Oh, no. It's it's non abelian but it's color ordered. Oh, color ordered. Yeah, so I factorized all the color traces. And the only thing that uh, matters to us by the fact that it's color ordered is that now I'm not, I'm talking about like planar, planar diagrams. So once I calculate it, if I find that my result has a pole in the 1-3 uh, channel, something is wrong. Okay. And we'll see that, that that's where the inconsistency actually is. So that's a, it's, it's a good question. The color ordered amplitude for a non theory. So in generalized unitarity, the first thing that we do is we express the amplitude as uh, the little group factor times a sum over scalar master integrals. We can think about it uh, kind of like a Pastorino Veltman decomposition in terms of scalar integral. There are only four integrals that can appear here for a one loop diagram in 4D. Uh, and they are all distinct from each other because they have a different branch cut structure. So some of them will have a log, some of them will have a log squared, okay? Uh, so you can, so it's a basis uh, with 
elements with distinct, distinct branch cuts. And also, there has to be also a rational term which has no branch cut, cuts and has a rational dependence on uh, the Mandel stems. And this is something that we're not going to be able to fix from doing unitary cuts of the cuts on both sides. So basically, uh, this all possible loop integral is is a classified according to Lorentzian elements, or what's the, what's the assumption here? Classified according to? No, I mean, how do you clarify all possible loop integral with, with, without a uh, So in for, in 4D, term? I can tell you exactly what they are. They're, it's it's very simple. It's a scalar integral, one over just the propagators in the. In the no, no, but you can you can use in Feynman rule, but I mean now I think is uh, we are forget Feynman rule, right? We are forget diagram. So how do you clarify loop integral? Uh, You're using low end environments. What's the assumption here? So all I'm saying is that whatever the amplitude is, yeah, it has to be um, well, propagated. You you you, have, you need to impose the locality, right? You need to have assumption for the loop integral to be clarified. I don't think they totally forget about the Feynman rules. <coughs> oh, I understand. Yeah, yeah. You don't totally forget about the Feynman rules. Yeah, sure, sure. You assume that it's a, the same very... kind of rational function and you're just fixing all the coefficients. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Or, or if you don't like calling it Feynman rules, you can call it uh, perturbation theory. Right, sure, sure. Yeah. So we want to do unitary cuts on both sides and we want to fix the coefficient C4 and C3 and C2, and then see what we get. So how do we get the coefficients? We do unitary cuts on both sides. So let's start with the right-hand side, where we have these known uh, master integrals. For example, you uh, asked about uh, the, the basis of master integrals. For example, I3, this is what it looks like. It's just the loop integral, of one over the propagators we think it has. Okay. Okay? Now, cutting, just means uh, replacing uh, the denominator by a delta function. Okay, and it's just putting it on the shelf. And uh, so the operation of cutting will just make this integral go to this integral, which forces the on shellness of L, L minus P1, and L plus P4. So now what we want is we want to parameterize L in a very convenient way such that these delta functions will be automatically satisfied. And just as a hint, uh, it's, a, it's a massless for momentum, okay? Um, it's, uh, you, we can, uh, we have basically four degrees of freedom uh, up, to, uh, up to some degeneracy in the coefficients. So we can parameterize it in a way which will put this, this, and that automatically on shell. And then the integral will only depend on one degree of freedom. Sorry, can you just, um, what is this operation exactly? Because you're, you're putting all of the, there's three different I'm factors three you're putting on shell. So what is this, what is the basis of this? So right now I didn't choose the basis yet, and that's going to be the next slide. Okay, but I mean, this is not, I mean, because I'm, I'm just used to the normal sort of, um, you know, like, um, you know, Kankoski cuts, right? And there you're choosing a particular Right, so this is diagram. generalized. This is something different. Yeah, it's generalized unitary. So you just take the uh, moment and you just, you're allowed to put them on the shelf. Okay, so we have any particular significance. Yeah, so you can, as long as you do it on both sides, you're allowed to do it. Yeah. So I, I choose a subset of my uh, my internal lens and I just decide to put them on the shelf. So, I, so now I decide to put these three things on the shelf, but I'm going to have one more degree of freedom. Sorry. Okay. So this is the parameterization, which manifestly gives you uh, L squared equals L minus P1 squared equals L plus P4 squared equals zero. And let me explain a bit what that means. So, uh, we know that uh, one angle times one angle uh, is anti-symmetric, so that's going to be zero. Uh, uh, two angles together are anti-symmetric to so the exchange of two. So one times one is going to be zero. So 
what happens if we take L times L? We're going to have one sigma bar mu 4, okay, uh, times one sigma mu 4, and then we can just fierce it, and we'll get 1 times 1, 4 times 4, which is 0. And this is why L squared is 0. Let's look at this, okay? P1 squared is 0 because P1 is a massless momentum. L, L squared is 0 because we just showed it. All we have to show is that L times P1 is 0. But what happens if we multiply L by P1? It means that we're just putting P1 here. And according to the massless direct equation, when P1 acts on the spinner velocity 1, it will just give us 0. And for that exact reason, if I multiply this by P4, P4 is going to act on this 4 and yield the 0. So this is why this parameterization <coughs> automatically satisfies the uh, cut conditions. Okay, so as soon as I, as I use this parameterization, the loop integral just becomes a, uh, an integral over my one degree of freedom that's left, which is this uh, constant of uh, prefactor t times the Jacobian uh, that I'm just driving along. I don't need to calculate this Jacobian because it will appear, appear on both sides of my generalized unitary cut. Uh, so this is the result for the right-hand side. Know that. This is what's going to remain from this integral. Okay? Note that if I put these, there's going to be some contribution from I4 as well, but there's a clever way to kind of disentangle these contributions. Now we're going to go to the left hand side. On the left hand side, we can use the exact same parameterization, T1 sigma 4, and we do cuts. And now these cuts, actually the amplitude has to factorize on its cuts. So it's going to be an integral dt, jt this Jacobian, and it's going to be the product of three lower point amplitudes. Literally this one, this one, and this one. And these we already know from the middle group. So this is one of them. This is this amplitude. This is the other. This is the one with two outgoing momenta here. And this is this one. I multiply them together. Uh, I can, uh, using my parameterization uh, of L, I can fix this values of the spinner elicity variables for L, for L1, which is L minus P1, for L3, which is L plus P, P4. So these are the spinner velocities according to my parameterization. Then substitute in this relation. And eventually, uh, what I get is that uh, if I equate the two sides, or I did the cuts on the two sides, uh, the coefficient is equal to the product of these three low point amplitudes. There's a subtlety of, I need to take what's called the nth zero t. So on the left hand uh, side, I actually have some integral dt. Uh, so I do this manipulation, I don't really get into it too much. It's basically taking the lead term and the Laurent expansion of one over t. So the bottom line is, I have a concrete way of getting this coefficient by doing unitary cuts on both sides, and this is what it is. So yeah. uh, t is the Lorentz environment point here. What is t the region? T, t is the physical mean? It's not Mandelstam t. This t here is just a parameter. Okay. <coughs> I'm parameterizing the loop. So I had a, I had four degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. I did three cuts. I specify three of these four degrees of freedom. Okay. I have one more degree of freedom to do a loop integral on. Okay. This is a matter of infinity to plus infinity, right? The, the region, the, the integral region of the T. Mm -hmm. What's the region? Oh. What's the value of T to the minus infinity to plus infinity? Uh, no. It, it should be bounded on. I'm trying to think if it's zero to infinity or minus infinity. I think it's probably zero to infinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zero to infinity. 
So by doing unitary cuts on uh, both sides, I can do a triple cut and a quadruple cut and a double cut, and I can do a lot of work. I can nail down all the coefficients for the master integrals. Note that I wrote the coefficients for uh, a left-handed <coughs> fermion going in a loop and a right-handed fermion going in a loop. That will change the value of the three-point amplitude that I'm multiplying together when I do the cuts. So this is why these uh, coefficients are different between the left-handed and the right-handed. Now, subscript well, around i is just the number of connected one. The i for i3 is sub subscript. i3? Three. Well, three. Ah, this? No, i. Um, i. i4, i3, i3. Uh -huh. Oh, that's number just, of cuts? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. it's uh, not the number of cuts, it's the number of propagators. Because in the master integral. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be 1 over 2 propagators. Good. So, uh, remember what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to construct from a, a bottom, in a bottom-up way the one-loop amplitude in a theory which has uh, anomalous matter content and I'm looking for a contradiction without even saying the word gauge or anything of that sort. So where would the contradiction, contradiction arise? It's definitely not going to arise in the vector contribution, uh, the vector sum of the contribution of the left-handed plurality and the right-handed plurality. Right? So, if I subtract one from the other, this is where my problem should uh, come up. So that's why I, I just look at the differences between the left-handed contribution and the right-handed contribution. That's just a calculation of a trick. I, what I could have done is I could have also forgotten about the right hand and said I only have one while for me on the loop, there would also be an inconsistency. Okay, but it's easier for me to include both the left and the right, but then just to look at the difference between the contribution of the left and the right. And what about this rational term? I couldn't fix it by, uh, by unitarity alone, but it doesn't mean that there's nothing I can do. Um, I mean, sum up and, and uh, yeah, I fixed all the coefficients, but the unknown rational term. The next thing uh, that I can do to fix the rational term as much as I can is use the final tool that I have in my arsenal. That the whole amplitude, including the ones that the part that I reproduced from cuts, plus the rational term, should factorize on all its, all its poles. And particularly because it's a color-ordered amplitude, it's not allowed to have a pole which is uh, not in two adjacent uh, legs. You cannot have an S13 pole. So that constrains the potential rational term that I can uh, have in the amplitude. So the, in particular, the S13 pole of the one loop amplitude is the S13 pole of this is just a little group factor factorized out. The part that I reconstructed, I know now what these CI is, but I don't know what the, this R is. I can take the pole of this term, and I can see that it does have an S13 pole. So for consistency, the rational term better be such that it cancels this S13 pole. Uh, and indeed, if you uh, account for the uh, cyclic invariance that you want, from the rational term, that fixes what it can be uniquely to this combination. You see that that has an S13 pole, which exactly cancels the S13 pole. So we could say that there's no inconsistency because I found the rational term and unitarity and locality were preserved. But that's, uh, that's uh, being a little naive because the Park Taylor. Uh, factor, the little group factor, which multiplied this whole thing, already had an S12 pole, this is an S pole, and, uh, and a T pole, S14. So when it multiplied this R, it's like I modified the residues of these poles. But the residues of these poles are, are well known tree level uh, or lower point amplitudes. I can't just change the residue of something that worked. I'm messing up with the residue. So if I can't interpret uh, 
the whole amplitude, including the rational term, as the product of uh, lower core amplitudes when I go to the S134 or S12 pole, I'm in trouble. And that's what happens. So what about the UI? Sorry? What about the UI scaping? Uh, how do you determine the rational term? U1? Yeah. Now this is the, because the, you say that it's because the color order. That's oh, why you don't have yeah. the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, That's a good it? question. So I think the inconsistency for an abelian theory would uh, show up at two loops and not at, a, okay. not at one loop. This is a very good question. Okay, okay. Yeah, so we're going to see uh, yeah, the okay. non-abelian uh, anomaly here. Okay. Right? So for example, when we uh, when we go to the S12 pole, the uh, Park Taylor amplitude times the rational term has a non-trivial residue, and that actually cannot be interpreted consistently uh, as lower point amplitudes. So we're in trouble. There's no way we built something in a manifestly unitary way. There's no way to make it lower. Okay, and that's inherent to this theory, and it's inherent to every theory that has an anomalous matter content. So that's actually the on-shell meaning of having a gauge in mind, without even saying the word gauge. Note that the tension here is between locality and unitarity, while when we uh, spoke in the field theory language, we thought the tension was between unitarity and Lorentz invariance. So this somehow sounds more, even more severe Okay, so it's kind of a, a curiosity that uh, I need to think about. I think probably um, because um, when you introduce gauge degrees of freedom, it's actually hard to see where the inconsistency really is. Inconsistency really is. I'm tending to think that the actual tension is really between unitarian locality. And when we worked on the field theory, we tricked ourselves to believe that it's uh, Unitarian and Lorentz invariance, but we were actually wrong in our traditional analysis. So this is something that's uh, worth thinking about. Okay. But this is something that's already been done, so what are we doing? So remember that I told you that in an EFT, it's okay to have uh, gauge analysis. So can I just ask, I mean, uh, I mean, you could also choose if you wanted to, you could... I mean, this is a one-loop diagram. It's a one-loop mm -hmm. fermion diagram. You don't have to do it this way. I mean, it could be, it's, you know, it seems like a doable calculation, right? You could do that. And if you just wrote down the, the, the loop integral, right, it's log divergent in four dimensions by power counting, right? So it turns into one of these, uh, presumably turns into one of these UD stories, right, where, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you know, that you, you either don't have a regulator or you have to impose word identities or something like that. My question is just, it, like I said, it seems like this is simple enough that this could just be done. I mean, just not using any of this technology, just good old-fashioned perturbation theory. Do you know if it has been done? So, can you say again what the question is? You can calculate a... You could I'm calculate rather, Yeah, I'm just saying calculate it just using standard Feynman diagram technology. It's a one loop diagram, mm -hmm. right? It could definitely be done without right. using all of this technology. There's mm -hmm. there's for example there's Pasolino Velton reduction, which is not which is just literally right. But the problem is that this diagram is log UV divergence, so it's ambiguous in that sense. But uh, but I mean when you calculate it you're gonna introduce gauge freedom, right? And then you've got to think about if your regulator... My gauge fields are just variant. external, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't need to fix any gauge in the loop. You don't need to fix a gauge in the loop, but you still need to uh, agree I'm with more say, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just trying this is just a different way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with nothing wrong with what you're doing. Yeah, 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 I understand. And I'm just saying I could just, I could just choose to do it in this way and try to define this amplitude. I don't need any gauge fixing, but I do need a regulator for the fermion loop, right? But then I think what you will see is that it will look like you're violating gauge invariance and not um, yeah, you're not reaching is, the tension between fine. unitarity and locality. Right. But then the... <coughs> so, my, so that's one thing you could do, and then right. you'll just see that gauge invariance is violated, but then you could have done it with a uh, triangle diagram already and like, just regular field theory. 
Sure, but the, the difference is that this is really an on, I mean, I could really look for an on-shell amplitude where it has to satisfy, you know, it has to have the properties of an on-shell amplitude. But my, 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 I also wanted to ask about that, if I, so I just wanted to know if you know if that has been done, because... Uh, I don't like think it it's been done. Then, then the other question is, is, is uh, in that language, it's not so easy to see uh, the, why there should, why you would expect to see a difference between the abelian and the non-abelian case. So you would say that if one were to do that, then in the abelian case, you should just find everything's fine with that amplitude. In the abelian case, there is no requirement that the amplitude is color ordered, so it's okay to have the spurious S1 three pole, and then that, and then your rational term can be whatever it wants to be. Yeah, but from, the, from this other point of view, you're certainly not going to get uh, spurious poles, right? Right. So. The, the, so that's why I'm saying it's a little harder to see why you would get a difference between the abelian and non abelian case if you did it that way. Right. So it's hard for me to think on the spot how what the interplay with, with gauge and fairness will be. But we should yeah. we should talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, like will will there be a will there be a regular ambiguity or not? I mean, just another comment is I, I don't think I don't see this thing of being locality versus Lorentz invariance as being a big thing because the point about uh, if you work with gauge fields if you just say I'm I am working with gauge fields okay then you're then you've just imposed locality that's one thing that cannot go wrong because mm -hmm. you have fields mm -hmm. so what will so what will go wrong is something else namely Lorentz invariance or gauge invariance which are secretly the same thing. So, anyway, I don't see that as a big mystery. That's what you would expect, mm -hmm. right? But then, you're, because but then you're not using say, fields. You're saying I want to impose other things, right? I'm not saying that I have fields. I have, you know, I'm going to require the cuts and things like this. For us. Well, unitarity. Unitarity. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. but, you're not uh, guaranteed unitarity if you use fields. Right. So then, then my question is. Um, so you're saying that gauge invariance and Lorentz invariance are, are two phases of the same thing? Yeah, they're then, exactly the same but thing. Gauge, That's what Weinberg taught us. But then, gauge symmetry, but then gauge symmetry is made up, and Lorentz invariance is not made up. So how does that work? The thing is that it's the combination of Lorentz transformations and gauge transformations that are a symmetry. Mm -hmm. That's the point. The point is, is that if you want, so it's a lot. It's this okay. is all in Weinberg. Anyway, this yeah. is a standard thing. We can discuss it later. Okay. Because can, sure. So, so sure. I, I just okay. I just think this formalism is kind of the continuation of of one, like bringing Weinberg to the extreme. In a sense. Sure. Sure. Uh, okay. Good. So, what? Let, let's just quickly recap. What we're doing is we want to show that the massive theory is okay, and we, so we want to repeat the same calculation in the massive amplitude formalism and show that we don't have these spurious poles. Now, computationally, this is a little hard, and uh, when we started, I don't think there was any generalized unitarity calculation in the massive amplitude formalism. I think since then, there might have been a calculation by uh, Cliff Chung et al. for, uh, for black hole uh, postman posting correction. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so what do you do? You define bolded spinners, so, Effectively, you're taking the square root of your momentum again, but because it's a massive momentum, you've got to have an extra SU2 index on your, uh, on your spinner velocity variables. Just a matter of the rank of the P matrix. Uh, and now again, we want to take the one loop amplitude now for the scattering of four massive vectors and present and expand it in this basis. Um, The general form of the coefficients will be like this. I don't get into it too much. This is just separating the little group transformation, which is now trivial. It's just uh, each one of them tri uh, transforms like a doublet of the SU2 little group times this huge uh, tensor uh, with uh, spinner indices. So now they do your loop in go including the mass, right? No, because the fermions are massless. Oh, only fermions do mass. Yeah, the, only the vectors are massive. Good. So uh, let's do a simpler example than what we did before. Let's look at the uh, at four cuts. 
quadruple cut. So now we're cutting I4, we're putting all these propagators on the shell. So the I4 just becomes a product of delta functions for everything. So that's just one. Okay, and we drop the 2 pi up to the fourth factor. That's just the right hand of the expansion on the mass square integral basis. What happens on the left side? On the left side, we're again cutting it four times, multiplying the tree level amplitudes here. Uh, we do it like this, and note that there's a nice little uh, cyclic uh, pattern here. Right? It's uh, the four leg sandwiching the L momentum going to one, one, L1 going to two, and so on and so forth. We just need to solve the cuts to put all these internal legs on shell. So, so for that, we have a little uh, uh, parameterization which is a little more involved. The difference from the previous case is because before we expressed L in the basis made of the spinner of elicity variables that corresponded to the, at, the outgoing momenta. We had four angle sigma uh, one bracket. But now these uh, outgoing momenta are massive, so it's hard to just take their square root into the spin of this variable. So the uh, nice trick in four days paper from 07 is to form linear combinations of, uh, of uh, P1 and P4 to have these flat vectors. These flat vectors, just think about them as linear combinations of P1 and P4. But the nice thing is that these flat vectors are now masses. So we can take their square root, we can define spinner elicity variables that correspond to them, and then we can ex expand L in the basis of P, uh, sorry, this should then be a 4. P1 flat, P4 flat, and then um, these vectors. <coughs> So what was it B? Sorry. What is supposed B? to be flat? Some yeah, of your B's, is flat. some of your flats are B's. Uh, right. Sorry. It's okay. They're, they're all flats. They're all flats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're all flats. Uh, as a side note, okay. Ask me later what's the connection of like flat vectors to monopoles. I have a very interesting story. This is what I'm working on. You have to call John up for that. <laughs> But, but is, there, is the claim here, sorry, so is the claim here that, uh, the claim is not that you can make all of the, you can, you can find linear combinations, you can't find four independent linear combinations that are all massless, but you can at least find two of them, is yeah. that what you're doing? Yeah. And that's enough, that still simplifies things. Yeah, because then I form these, I take the square root to have the square and, and now I have four massless vectors that are, the, that are on my basis. And I can expand the null momentum in this basis, noting that there has to be a relation between uh, between my coefficients. I only have three degrees of freedom. So I have four degrees of freedom with a constraint to express a general null momentum. Uh, so this is the generic parameterization that, uh, that puts three of the legs uh, on shell. I'm doing a quadruple cut, so I'm going to have to solve for t. t is not free variable that I integrate So I did the solution, I solved for t, uh, plug it back, back in. Remember these kind of L sandwiched between uh, massive spin relative variables were the main components of my amplitude. So I simplified it, a lot of field chain. Let's not get into it too much. Bottom line is, this is my C4, and I know exactly what uh, each one of these is, is a function of my, uh, basically my mass and my Mandelstam variables. So this is how I fix C4 in the mass performance. This is something that hasn't been done before. Note that there was one extra consistency check that we should do here, is that when we take the massless limit, it should reduce to the massless result that I showed you before. And here's kind of a Nice thing when I take the uh, masses limit, this is something you can see in Lehman's paper about scattering amplitudes for our masses and spins. I'm reintroducing gauge freedom in a sense. So, how do I see this gauge freedom in the spinner elicity formalism? I, my uh, my uh, spinner elicity variables basically 
uh, depend on a reference uh, spinner, and you can see that there's uh, um, an independence on the reference spinner. So uh, if I have four, four outgoing vectors, now I'm going to have four reference spinners then independently. And if I reverse engineer it, this is equivalent to just shifting polarization vectors by a factor of, uh, proportional to p. So this is literally the agent variance in the distance. So this is a very strong constraint. If I did any arithmetic mistake along the way, I'm never going to be independent of these four reference spinners. So this is why, even though I grind, grinded a lot of algebra in my calculation, I'm sure of every single minus sign, just because once one minus sign is wrong, you don't get the correct mass estimate. So you're doing data by hand, or you're doing them program? Both. <laughs> Both, okay. Yeah. But eventually program is. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> So yeah, you write a code that you know takes these uh, these tree-level amplitudes and fuses them together. And, and this, uh, uh, yeah, and here I'm showing how to get the mass system. And the test. Um, so bottom line, we calculated all the coefficients in the massive theory. We've got pretty uh, horrendous expressions. We checked that we get the correct masses limit, which is, we took a lot of work. And now we're kind of one step before like the <coughs> gist of the product, right? We want to take the S13 pole and to show that uh, uh, it factorizes correctly on this S13 pole. Either that or that there's an S13 pole, but there's a rational term we can introduce to cancel it, but this rational term doesn't modify the residues in the other poles. So one way or another, uh, the massive amplitude should be okay. And note that then we can go to the massless limit and kind of derive the cutoff on our EFT just from taking the massless limit and showing that something goes wrong along the way. For example, it could be one, one over S13 and one over S13 minus uh, M squared. And once I take the massless limit, they fuse together into a double pole. And that could be, uh, that could signify the breakdown of the theory. So that's the uh, expectation that we have uh, from our calculation. So this is basically on shell Prescott. The last thing that I will comment is that I'm half satisfied by this, even if it works, because let's say I got a technical technical reason a spurious pole here, there isn't a spurious pole here. That's that's a step forward in the right direction, but it's still not telling me what. why. <laughs> why is it uh, possible to quantize the massive theory, and it's not possible to quantize the massive theory? And I, I only want to answer it in a purely gauge invariant way. Now, the last time I gave this talk, um, people uh, basically gave me the classical field theory answer because in the massive theory you can always think about it as an EFT while in the movie you have some spectator fermions that cancel <coughs> the anomaly. Okay, that's that's a good enough field theory reason. But that doesn't that kind of um, appeals to the UV completion. And I want I want an internal consistency check of the EFT without kind of looking at the UV completion. Um, so yeah if anybody has thoughts about that? Really it. So the field theory side is that um, anomalous CFTs can be uh, quantized in a consistent way. We saw it from the field theory perspective, but you can also uh, potentially see it from an onshell uh, perspective. Uh, in massless theories, the tension arises is, uh, between the unitary and the locality and not unitary in variance invariant, at least from the onshore perspective. Uh, yeah, that's basically what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> very nice talk and a very nice picture. <laughs> so any question for both will be okay. <laughs> any question? 
Your paper is uh, coming out soon. Sorry? Your paper is coming out oh, soon. Uh, it's always coming out soon. Ah. <laughs> that makes sense. It's coming out once we figure out. You know, we're, we're like 95% of the way. Yeah. But then we have a result. We're trying to take the poll. But the, what, what, what if you have an expression like five pages long and you need to take some poll? Of it? It's uh, annoying. Of course. But, uh, we'll do it. <laughs> okay. That's why I need a quantum computer. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, Peter, again. No <laughs> problem. Okay. You want to say something about the flat? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I read about these flats for generalized unitary. And then we had a completely different question. Is there, is, is there some reason for the terminology? Is it just I have no idea. It comes from a, uh, a paper by book. some Greek yeah, guy. I know. Well, I know. I know what flat is. But I, I don't, don't know, know how. how. Well, I guess I'm not good. Flat <laughs> <laughs> this comes from some paper by a Greek <laughs> from the 90s or the early It's like a half modification or music. It's a half step. It's going down a half step, right? <laughs>